would like to welcome Vita van der Werf on our virtual stage, who is the founder of Sea Ranger Service and an Ashoka Fellow from the Netherlands. Um, he has done many, many great things uh, and won many great awards, uh, but I think we will ask about it uh, in detail after his presentation. So I'm gonna pass the stage to you, Vita. Welcome, and we are happy that you are here today with us. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to also be here. And um, even though Hungary doesn't have a sea, <laughs> uh, of course the ocean in terms of the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe is relevant to all of us. And the health of the ocean is something that should matter to all of us. And so I'm very um, yeah, grateful that you're willing to give me a bit of time to, yeah, to, talk, about, um, to talk about oceans. And what I'm gonna do is actually not talk about the issues that the ocean faces, uh, because I'm sure many of us have heard about plastic pollution and overfishing, and but I'm actually going to talk about how I worked with a team of people and bit by bit um, made real impact uh, uh, for the ocean, but in a very entrepreneurial way. That actually ocean conservation typically has never really followed that sort of um, that sort of model. Um, so I'll do the presentation, talking about my work, and you know, and I'd love to have a bit of a discussion or answer questions afterwards. Um, also how you may view this way of working. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, just to kick off the presentation. And really, um, it's essentially talking about how this organization, the Sea Ranger Service, uh, originated um, five years ago. So to put a little bit in perspective, this is me when I'm, uh, I think, seven years old. So I was always in the outdoors, a big lover of nature, um, you know, very much always in the forest and in the, you know, out. Um, I played my first computer game when I was 13 for about 10 minutes and was very bored straight away. So never did that again. So I was always a, yeah, a kid that was outdoors. And, and that actually translated itself into becoming a youth ranger when I was nine years old, um, fast forwarding a number of years, 15 years later, I work on a research ship in Antarctica. Um, I managed to join various um, yeah, Antarctic research expeditions. I work for many of the larger environmental NGOs, um, you know, really feeling that I had to do something to, to protect this planet, to protect the environment. And increasingly what I realized is that one of the biggest challenges we face is around the protection of the ocean. Because if we're talking about food or the amount of species or the area that has the most severe type of pollution, um, but also where most of our oxygen comes from that we breathe, actually this is the ocean. And the ocean, of course, is so big that it's very difficult to manage. It's very difficult to actively take care of the ocean, to conserve our oceans. So what I also realized is that I was working for environmental NGOs and year after year, I would go to these big conferences, um, you know, and there's all these big sort of commitments. People say, actually, you know, we are going to, in 10 years time, protect so much of the ocean. Um, and that was of course very encouraging and especially encouraging because what they call MPAs, Marine Protected Areas, are essentially parts of the ocean that are protected by law. And that means that um, there is basically limited fishing allowed. Um, people aren't allowed to, to dump waste there. Um, you know, it's, it's essentially a sort of protected environmental area at sea. And currently, more than 13,000 of these areas exist in the ocean worldwide. Um, there's just one problem. And that is that currently, less than 0.5% uh, has capacity. And that means that while the ocean is protected on paper, in reality, of course, the ships and the people that are needed to be out at sea, to monitor, to research, to, to check that it is really, you know, not being exploited, that is, of course, very costly. Um, and most governments, they really struggle. They don't have the capacity, they don't have the money to finance actively uh, patrolling the ocean. So, I started thinking a few years ago, like how can we change this? How can we ensure that the ocean is actively protected? Um, and how can we make it in a way that is financially sustainable? However, <laughs> that's a good question because how do you 
you know, how do you, I mean, where do you even start? If it's too expensive for governments, how can even I, as a social entrepreneur with no business experience, um, you know, set up a model that could work? Um, and we achieved it. Um, and essentially, I'm now sort of going to show how, how that was done. So the first thing we did is we developed a social innovation. And the social innovation is that I found out that the highest youth unemployment in almost every country that borders the sea is in the port cities and the coastal areas. So actually, you know, where there is high unemployment, that of course is a prime uh, region to bring jobs to young people that need it most. So we developed a new profession, a new job, you could say, it's called the Sea Ranger. And the Sea Ranger is essentially um, a, yeah, a ranger, like a park ranger, working out at sea to manage these marine protected areas. Now, Sea Rangers initially are recruited in, in boot camps. So they join these boot camp trainings that are partly run by the Navy in the Netherlands. We have a collaboration with the Navy. There's a lot of structured discipline training, of course, sailing as well. And ultimately, at the end, if you are selected as a Sea Ranger, then you get a paid job for a full year. You are in paid employment for a full year. And during that year, you build up experience, you get a qualification, and it allows you to work for other maritime companies. So essentially, it's a way to give people, young people jobs to train them for a, a career at sea. Now, the second innovation is that we thought many governments use these motor ships to patrol the ocean. And we think we can do so cheaper, and we can do so uh, cleaner. So we developed a sailing ship that is fully certified um, to be basically manage and patrol ocean areas. Um, now, because of course it's a sailing vessel, there's hardly any CO2 emissions. Um, it's a lot cheaper to operate. Um, and that um, of course means that then it's a very attractive alternative to using other types of ships. And we also built these ships. So we, are training sea rangers, but we also own a shipbuilding company. We started a shipbuilding company. And here you see a photo of a shipyard in near the near the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, where we are actively building these kind of sea ranger ships. Um, and also in the coming years, building more of these vessels to actively patrol uh, our ocean. Now, probably you, you're, you're, uh, you, you may ask, what do sea rangers do then day to day? So sea rangers do anything from um, measuring, in this case, the measuring and, 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 and sort of sampling plastic pollution. So we're tracking the pollution out at sea. Uh, we also use drones. We fly drones to inspect if there's no pollution from the big uh, cargo ships or other types of ships that are out at sea. Um, we are involved in climate research. So where the ocean is changing and warming waters have an effect on the nutrients in the sea. This is also where we do crucial research to, yeah, to show what, what that looks like. Um, and then actually the big focus is on the marine protected areas. So actively patrolling, managing these marine protected areas. Now, that means we ultimately have sea rangers with a whole list of tasks that they are now mandated to carry out. So any types of drones and underwater robots we use for inspection work, um, we do research, we, we patrol the, the ocean. Now, all of that sounds great, but the really crucial part here is that unlike environmental NGOs, we don't raise funds. We don't ask for donations. We don't get subsidies from governments. We are contracted for this work. So we managed to convince the Dutch government and increasingly the other governments to pay us for this work. And that means that of course we have income and we can then, if we've covered our costs, we can have more of our ship work out at C4 for conservation work. And that conservation work increasingly looks like this. It's actively measuring and restoring, for example, seagrass in our oceans. Um, seagrass grows near the coast. Um, it's a, a natural sort of process whereby seagrass takes in CO2 and turns it into oxygen. Um, and actually in some areas in the world, uh, seagrass can take 30 times more CO2 than forests and turn it into oxygen. So seagrass is like an ultimate climate mitigator. However, when you have to actively restore it, when you have to plant seagrass, of course, it's very expensive. You have to be out at sea. It's difficult you know, to get ships. So this is where we as the sea ranchers can play a really, really big role. 
Now, one of the reasons in the European context that this is really crucial um, and really relevant is that the European Commission has announced a new oceans mission. And that means that over the next 10 years, the EU wants to actively restore 20% of all the degraded marine environments in European seas. And that means actively planting seagrass, repairing oyster beds, um, fixing uh, coral reefs. Um, and of course, you know, this is where sea rangers can play a, a really big role. So increasingly we found that actually, while a lot of people campaign for new laws, the sea ranger service, we have a way to build the capacity, the infrastructure, literally build the ships and train the sea rangers to do the work. And governments are crying out. They are very happy for this kind of support because it allows them to essentially contract us and we take care of attracting all the investment of all the, uh, the financing that's needed to, to scale this. Um, just a couple of more slides just to show how we essentially then take the next sort of big step. Just going one, one photo back. So this is a photo of the first government that signed was the Dutch government. And it wasn't just the environment minister, but also the government minister for economics and for social affairs. So government acknowledged that this has a strong social economic impact. And of course, if the protection of nature creates jobs, um, you know, and, and, and helps to bring a social economic impact, then of course, politicians are very keen to listen, um, you know, and, and keen, to, keen to support. So with the help of Ashoka, but also IKEA and PwC, who work for us entirely for, for free, they have essentially helped us to develop a franchising model. So similarly, how IKEA expands to different countries with their stores, we are now expanding to different countries around Europe with our Sea Ranger service, allowing entrepreneurs in other countries to learn from our model and our experiences and set up a Sea Ranger service in exactly the same way. Now, all of this means um, that really we set up a business um, that over the next uh, 20 years, we believe can restore 1 million hectares of underwater landscape. And in that process, get 20,000 young people, um, you know, supported into working in the maritime industry. Um, so that is, of course, a way to tackle unemployment and at the same time, yeah, really restore, uh, restore, restore the ocean. Now, as a final image, um, you know, I think for me, one of the lessons I learned as well is that it's when you care about an issue, it's so important to campaign uh, on it and to, you know, it's often, I think, when we're passionate about something, it's with facts and figures, we're trying to convince people. Um, but actually, in the environmental movement, this is something we've done, overdone a little bit. The protection of the oceans is often very abstract. It's, 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 an, it's an environment that's very far removed from us. Um, so the fact that we've given it a human face, that we have young people at the prime of their lives who were given you know, new opportunities, and it's the identity and pride of being a sea ranger that they convey to politicians, to investors, to other young people. That's a very, very powerful role model, um, you know, to get other people involved, um, you know, in this kind of climate action and this kind of environmental restoration work. So we are just super excited to see that there's a lot of interest. The European Commission is on board. We have a lot of investor interest. Um, and yeah, over the next few years, we're going to scale to different countries. Um, and it's just, a, yeah, it's a very exciting time. But again, to do something from a different model that allows us to have a more financially sustainable way to really, really make impact, in this case, for ocean protection. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, you know, just, a, just a, the first question. Um, so you mentioned that you give a one year paid job to the sea rangers who are selected. Yeah. And what, what happens afterwards? When, when the yeah. one year is over. Yeah, so the beautiful thing is actually that because when they are sea rangers, we train them and we give them qualifications. After that year, we introduce them to other employers. So there are other companies, other even government agencies that are saying, oh, you know, we'd love to recruit your sea rangers because they have experience, because we see that they are young people with kind of a, you know, an, a, a societal focus. So it's interesting to see that, um, yeah, increasingly on the job market, um, those who have become been sea rangers is, are seen as having a lot of experience in doing this kind of work. And um, I also 
read that uh, for the trainings, uh, you employ uh, veterans from the Navy. Yeah. That's, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's also a very important impact that um, when they get older and when they leave their jobs, um, sometimes they may feel like purposeless, but with working with the young people, they can, uh, they can get something back as well. Absolutely. And I think as well, you know, in the in environmental work, what we, of course, typically do is that we work with like minded people. We find like minded people to be around us, um, you know, that think the same way. And what we did with the Sea Ranger Service is the exact opposite. We thought who could best train these Sea Rangers, who, who could bring them uh, some structure and discipline. Um, and of course, these are, you know, veterans from the Navy. But of course, many of these veterans, they don't actually. I would even go as far as to say they don't necessarily care about environmental protection or you know they're, they're not involved as activists or in the social impact or but they like the fact that their skills can make a difference to the lives of young people so suddenly there is a way to involve a whole group of people that typically is not involved in climate action or environmental work and this has been a concrete way to make them make a difference and i think that's so powerful if you can broaden uh, you know the the kind of stakeholders in this way I, I'm hearing a hidden advice that if you want to build up a, a successful social enterprise, think about who is like-minded. Don't invite them. Invite <laughs> those who are unlike-minded. Well, yeah, but it's also a question. I mean, maybe I've been involved in the environmental conservation work for so long that I look at it really critically. Because actually, our tactics as an environmental movement have pretty much stayed the same for the last 50, 60 years. But I think we also have to admit that we're not really winning because actually the state of our environment is worse than it's ever before. There's an accelerating climate crisis. So it's very rare that, that, that you know, the environmental organizations get together and, 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 and ask themselves the question, is it really impactful what we do? No one really asks that question. And I believe we are making too limited an impact. You know, we're raising a lot of awareness and that's of course really important, but what do you then do with the awareness? It has to translate into active work, it has to translate into, into real long lasting impact. So I think that is something I've just become more critical around. How do you, um, you know, ensure that you can broaden the amount of people that are involved and broaden the impact. Mm -hmm. um, also, you mentioned that now you have a shipbuilding company. I suppose it, it got, uh, it got to you along the way when you started, but I'm just curious how, how you started, like one day you woke up and you said like, I'm going to do this um, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. how it, you did this magic happen. Yeah, it, it was a long process. Um, so actually the inspiration came from a program, a conservation program that US, the American president Roosevelt in 1933 uh, ran during the Great Depression. So there was a big economic, of course, recession. There was a very high unemployment. And what he did is he essentially developed this model whereby young men from the cities that were unemployed, he actually recruited them to work and actively restore nature. And in nine years time, they planted over 3 billion trees. Um, and, and essentially it was the biggest restoration transformation of the US landscape. Uh, in history. So, and I thought that's so powerful because it created job opportunities for these young men. Uh, it restored nature. It had a social and environmental impact at the same time. So I actually spent time in the Library of Congress. I spent time in different archives. I found out whatever I could about how this model was run. And of course it was, you know, run by the, by the army. So I thought, well, if that's run by the army, I should have this being run by the Navy, eh, the Sea Ranger Service. And if they focus on the conservation of land, how can we translate it to focus on the conservation of the ocean? So essentially we took the lessons from almost a hundred years ago and we applied them to a modern day setting. And remarkably, and that's maybe also when you work in these coastal communities, there is a real sense of pride and identity around being a maritime community, you know, where often the fishing was very big and where everybody used to go and work at sea. And the idea that you appeal to people and you say, we're going to bring back some of that heritage. We're going to train young people for this work. That has a very popular support. 
you know, it's something people really like. So, yeah, it's been incredible to, yeah, to see how this evolves uh, over time. But going a little bit back more in time, um, I I know that you you by training you are a violin maker. True. True. <laughs> <laughs> so so how did you how did you turn into a social entrepreneur entrepreneur from from you know creating violins? Yeah. No. So yeah. So I so I was always involved in environmental activism from a young age, but then of course you don't earn money by being an environmental activist, right? I mean, you, you, there's not often not even a job. And I never studied at university. So unfortunately, unless you go into science or policy, you know, there's, there's very little, it's just not something that's sustainable over time. So I thought, well, I should learn a trade. Um, and I loved woodworking. So I became a violin maker. And I did that for about 10 years professionally. Um, yeah, and then it was just nagging at me constantly. I was thinking I'm now working, you know, on making yeah, you know, violins. In fact, I actually, one of the instruments I made is actually right here, right? Oh. But it's of and course do, an amazing- Do you also play the violin? Uh, no, not really, not really. <laughs> let, let's leave that for this time. But so it's of course an amazing craft and you do that work, but your world is so small. You know, you work, your world is, you're on your own. And I realized I don't want that after a while. Um, and the beautiful thing is that when you make a violin, when of course you have the wood in front of you, you know, if I give you some big blocks of wood and some tools and I say to you, make a violin, you probably think uh, it's crazy, it's almost impossible. Unless you know how, which steps to take. And then, you know, you take different steps, you perfect those steps, you go back to things you, you know, and, and that's how you learn. And that's actually how you can manage big projects. So actually you could say that I learned project management methodology uh, from simply making instruments and starting with something that initially seems almost impossible to achieve. But then once you learn and you take the steps, actually making a violin is not so much different to building a ship or to training sea rangers. Or it's all a question of what time do you spend on it? What materials do you use? What is the, yeah, the work methodology? So I think, yeah, it really taught me over time to appreciate that even those really big ambitious projects um, you know can be achieved can, can you apply the same uh, to business financing and uh, business planning sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um, yeah it's I mean I mean I never studied business school and actually I never studied in conservation either so the idea of now running a, a growing conservation business is of course uh, sometimes uh, yeah it's a little unnerving you could say um but yeah of course there's a lot of support from a lot of different partners we by now have an amazing team you know we have almost 40 people working for the sea ranger service full time it's you know it's it's getting busy so of course it's also about attracting the right people with the right expertise um and i more than anything have learned to be a good listener and mm -hmm. take on people's advice and you know really making sure we take the expertise that people have and make it useful for uh, for the program. No, that's that's an important skill of a leader, I, I suppose. But talking about a team, um, so I, I, I know that you started the Sea Ranger service when, um, when you won a grant. Um, who was the first colleague, co-founder, partner that you got on board? Yeah, so actually, one of the first people I got on board was a shipbuilder. Mm -hmm. And he already had a uh, sort of a ship that was half built, a new ship. So that also meant that he said, let's finish this ship as a Sea Ranger ship. So, yeah, so in the beginning, we, yeah, we thought, because I thought if I want to have a, build a Sea Ranger service, I have to build ships. So <laughs> that would be the first good partner to have on board. And interestingly, for the shipbuilders, it wasn't so much the idea of protecting the ocean, but the idea that we're going to build a very innovative ship, that it was something you know, new in, in the world of shipbuilding, that was a sort of intrinsic motivation for shipbuilders. So when I actually said one part of the program is to be really innovative about building these zero emission uh, you know, work ships that can work at sea, that was a way to appeal to the intrinsic motivation of shipbuilders. So suddenly we have shipbuilders, we have veterans. And so every time it, it, I learned over time to find sort of ways to, again, appeal to the intrinsic motivation of people. 
instead of me trying to convince people that we have to protect the ocean. Because if we ask someone, hey, would you like to contribute or would you like to do what you already love doing or what you're already good at? That's of course far easier than trying to, yeah, you know, convince people, get them over to your way of looking at things. And I think as activists or as social entrepreneurs, we often do that. We often try to convince people. Um, and I think that's a very tiring way of, of course, building, yeah, building a movement. It's, it's, yeah, it's difficult. So what's, what's your secret on getting on board people who are not like-minded, like, like the Dutch government or any type of government? Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I think it's mostly to do with how do you meet people at their level? How do you, you know, really invest some time into researching and, and understanding who people are and what makes them tick? Um, and that also means that you ultimately speak a language and you ultimately do whatever it takes, which means you dress and you speak and you behave and you, you know, in a way that makes people feel comfortable. So if I go to the government and I say, oh, we have to protect the ocean and, uh, you know, so then of course it doesn't work. So when I meet government, I, I am like, I look like a corporate lawyer, literally. And when I, when I go, when we go to the government, they say, oh, we're very surprised. We did not expect this. We thought environmental work is, is somehow alternative. So that means you are also breaking the stereotypes people have. And the moment that they realize that they're in their head, something opens up and they're more open to really listening to what you have to say so it's kind of sort of a yeah persuasion slash psychology uh you know um learnings in there as well on how yeah how do you meet people at their level and, and have you have you realized about this like have you done it intentionally uh or did you learn about it somewhere how how did you get it, to this it, it happened naturally i think naturally. because yeah maybe i think it's a question of Let's say I have 10,000 people around the world who really care passionately about the ocean and they all, you know, are following us on Facebook and Instagram and they, you know, they're the supporters of the Sea Ranger service. That actually means nothing if they don't know about shipbuilding, if they don't give us the contracts from government, if they, you know, so just the awareness is not what we're after. So I think if, if, if we're building ships and training sea rangers and we are contracted for this work as a social enterprise, then of course we have to speak a kind of language of business and we have to um, yeah, really go out of our comfort zone. So I had to really go out of my comfort zone, almost to be like a chameleon, to be able to yeah, fit in an environment. Uh, if I speak with people from the Coast Guard or the Navy, that's of course very different from if I go to a local council and I talk to youth workers or I actually meet scientists and we say, hey, how can we best restore the seagrass here? Those are often kind of groups of society that don't really meet. Um, and that's, I think, also part of the, what's really been really exciting about starting the Sea Range Service. It's been the most unusual suspects that have made you know, really big impact together. Hmm. We got a question in the chat. And also I would like to just encourage you uh, any anyone from the audience that feel free to ask it by ask it by um, turning on your mics as well. But right now we got a question: uh, How how do you choose or find your franchise partners? Yeah, so the, the, the franchising is of course um, a methodology that allows you to essentially take a model and replicate it in exactly the same way in in other locations. So. You know, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, I'm not a big fan of Starbucks or McDonald's, but I think we can all agree what they do. They are really good at what they do. You know, they're successful at what they do. So what lessons can you learn? And um, so a lot of that is about standardization um, and replication. It's about ensuring that a Sea Ranger ship, the way it's built in a Sea Ranger, the way a Sea Ranger is trained, that that is happening the same everywhere. So what we now in, in launching the franchising program later this year, essentially the franchise partners will be people that have some business experience, as in they can run an organization well, um, and, and that they have a willingness to essentially adopt the Sea Ranger model fully. And then of course, we offer a lot of support. So we work with people and because it's franchising, it also means it's their business. If someone in 
you know, if someone in Greece wants to set up a Sea Ranger service, we help them, but it's their company, it's their social business. Um, um, and of course we make a lot of um, yeah, agreements on how that works. But that is, I think, a powerful thing as well. We can empower local entrepreneurs to take ownership over a project like this um, and to run it with the Greek Navy and Greek partners and the Greek government, because they have, of course, that knowledge on how to do that. So I think it's also, I, over time, I started to dislike, I would almost say the more traditional colonial NGO model, whereby, you know, you have an NGO that goes to, let's say, South Africa or works in India, and then the global director sits in London or Washington, D.C. or something, you know, and then they try to manage these local chapters. Um, I, I don't want to manage. I want to build a network and empower people and show, you know, how this model could, could work. So it's a different way, a yeah, different way of working. Mm. And, and you already have uh, franchise partners. Yeah, so of course, IKEA uh, and Ashoka, Friends of Europe, PwC, they help in lots of ways. We're launching the franchising program at the end of this year. And that's also mm -hmm. when we'll open up applications. Um, mm -hmm. Franchising is, while it can be very powerful, and if it works, is a, can be hugely successful at a very quick pace scale. Uh, on the other hand, legally and fiscally, it's really, really complex. So. Mm -hmm. I would even go as far as to say that we are one off, if not the first sort of ocean conservation solution that is replicated through franchising in this way. So there's just so much that we're learning. Um, but yeah, it's yeah very exciting, but it, it, it takes a little bit of time. Mm. Okay, so there's one question about financing. Um, yeah. Can you share with us a bit more on the monetizing of your business services and revenue operations till uh, 2040? You said you would coach and train uh, 20,000 youngsters by then. How are you going to sustain your social business until then? For how long are Ashoka, uh, IKEA, PVC, Friends of Europe supporting and funding you? What about government and what about citizens? Thank you. L long yeah, question. No. Yeah, thank you for the question. And that's a really good question. So our, bonus, yeah. our business model, our business model uh, essentially relies on two... I hear a big do you, echo. Do you want to yeah. ask it, Annette? Yeah, Annette. Uh, I'm not sure if my camera is working. No, it's fine. Thank you, Jane Bear, actually. <laughs> can you guys see me? I yes. don't see myself. Yeah. We can see and hear you. Yes. Wow, OK. Um, yeah, so basically, but thank you. Like, I, like you already like, uh, share it with one breath. But yeah, so. Um, Vicha, I'm just curious about your uh, monetizing of your business services and revenue operations. Uh, you mentioned the services you give, but I'm more interested on the scale of the like the monetizing part. Uh, then you also talk about these 20 youngsters you're gonna train and coach. And uh, I'm I'm also just wondering, so how are you gonna do it? For how long are Ashoka, PwC, IKEA, and also Friends of Europe uh, gonna like fund you, sustain you? Because you, of yeah. course, cannot yeah. always rely on your funding for partners, fathers, mothers. You need yeah. to be able to, yeah, uh, be independent and uh, more like market driven and market proof and also demand uh, proof and driven. Uh, and also, yeah, what about the gov uh, scale? What about the citizens uh, of your country and also of the other country? You're scaling up to Norway as well. Yeah. Um, so we are market driven. So mm -hmm. just to clarify, Ashoka, PwC, IKEA, we don't receive any funding from them. Nothing. Oh, really? okay. They only help us in the first development of the franchise model. Because of course, oh. IKEA, you know, IKEA is a franchise, so they know really well, you know, how do I make sure? Because one thing about IKEA is, of course, every IKEA store you go into, the experience is really thought of well. It's very well designed. So how can we make sure that in future a sea rangership and the way that works is similarly effectively run? That was one of the reasons why I thought, you know, uh, instead of working with McDonald's or, or Starbucks, maybe IKEA is a good partner to learn from. And they were very forthcoming, very open in sharing. PwC have said the first sort of couple of years, we will not charge you. Any questions, how this works legally, fiscally, we will organize for you, which is incredible. I think we would have spent like probably three, 400,000 by now just to get that expertise. Yeah, it is so, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so we are, yeah, so we are market driven. 
Having said that, the first few years of development was, of course, with some grants and awards, and that really helped. But it's important not to underestimate what offshore services really mean, because that means that you have... So we are not just offering the ship. We are offering a commercially certified ship. So that means that when, when the government or the industry have to go out to sea to do environmental management or research, they need a certified ship. And the barrier is very high. So typically for a ship of our size, people pay minimum, I would say, nine, 10,000 euros a day to operate a ship. So if you have a program of three or four months and you're paying 10,000 euros a day, that's very costly. And of course, the budgets for this offshore work are very big. So we're suddenly saying, hey, we can do the same work, qualitatively the same. We have all the certification and permits. However, it's cheaper because our ship is actually uh, you know, less than half of that cost per day. Uh, it's of course cleaner because we have almost no emissions. So suddenly you as a company or a government agency, you can report back on, 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 the, on the emission saving. And there is social yeah. impact because we're also training people for your industry. So that makes it suddenly really attractive and that makes it a, a, a whole different type of package. So the offshore services, you know, we, one ship will, will bring in roughly every year around, I would almost say seven, 750,000 to operate one ship. That's typically five, six clients for that whole. So the, the amount of contracts are, you know, quite sizable. So, um, so that is essentially how we sustain the business, that if we start in Norway, if we start in the UK or in other areas, where are the contracts? What can we do at sea? Can we, can we help with growing seaweed, uh, with seaweed farms at sea? Can we help with the maintenance? Can we do climate research? Can we do maintenance on the offshore wind farms? Is there anything that is about sustainable use of the ocean where we can play a role? And then our ships in the industry, in the market, suddenly uh, offer a really attractive alternative. Now, there's one additional uh, revenue that we generate, and that is that for local councils and municipalities and port authorities, mm -hmm. it's actually a really big problem that they're dealing with high youth unemployment. So the council, if we have a young person that is in unemployment that gets benefit payment from the government, if we successfully get that person back to work, then the government or the local municipality pays us a fee. So we are contracted by the local councils and they of course contract us if we're successful in making that impact. Because then if the people you know, are not in unemployment anymore, then there's no unemployment payment. So the government saves money. Um, so these are ways in which we've amazing. looked- It's like a triple yeah, for all the part that yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so it fits together. And there's one more aspect just before you go. <laughs> so just to complicate matters a little bit more, when someone sets up a franchise, what they essentially franchise is the services and the training, the bootcamp training. So that's what I just explained, those two revenue sort of generating uh, services. Um, but then there's still the ship. So we build ships that in future the franchisees will charter. That also means that when, for example, in Norway, they make money with the contracted work, they pay it to us and they charter a sea ranger ship. So that also means that we are looking how we're going to build more ships, manage them centrally. Um, yeah, big, big process, but um, that essentially also allows us as, as the main company to, to charter these ships to our franchisees. And that's what we also make a little bit of money on. So can we say that the, your first revenue stream is basically uh, government and local municipalities and the second stream is actually uh, from private companies? Yeah, but that's not, that was initially the way, but it's changing now. So I would say where up until now, 70, 80% has been government contracts. It's also important to clarify that it's not government subsidies, it's actual contracts at work. Um, increasingly, mm -hmm. of course, it is about having commercial firms paying for the work. And actually commercial companies, when they work at sea, increasingly the law forces them to cut emissions, to think about social impact. So this is also a kind of a service we can, you know, even the maritime industry really has to clean up mm -hmm. in the coming years. There's still a, you know, a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, uh, sorry to ask him father, but like, so uh, regarding the youngsters who are applying for this academy or bootcamp, do they need to pay for it or? No, so. Is it like yeah, res no. reskilling or like, like a upskilling fee for this training, uh, coaching they get and they can yeah, actually so, qualify to be a sea ranger? Yeah, so it's really mixed. 
So we have, of mm. course, young people that have a distance to the labor market. There's been some young people who've never finished high school. They've never they've dealt with uh -huh. homelessness or drug uh, abuse issues. Uh, the local mm -hmm. councils they pay if they pay us to involve these youth and to offer them the training. Mm -hmm. yeah, However, and yeah, because we sure. also have young people that are in university that that have all the opportunities that just want a gap year and they pay a short, small fee to join. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the social status and the like on the social status of the applicants. Correct. Yeah, and and it's been also a focus of us to really bring social cohesion. To re, you know, where do you have a situation where young people from lots of different, very extreme, I would almost say, social backgrounds are forced to work together in these kind of extreme, you know, it used to be when you, I guess you joined the army, maybe in, in the past. So, but that, that does mean that it, it yeah, it, it, it promotes this form of social cohesion. And we find that people from all types of backgrounds have a lot to learn from each other, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they have a lot of issues they all deal with. And with how many youngsters are you working so far? So, so far we work with just under 100 young people going through the programs. Um, okay. And next year, if we, so it's also one boot camp per year for every ship in operation. So we have a next ship, a new ship coming next year, and then we have a, an extra boot camp every year. So it sort of it sort of expands over time uh, uh, the impact that uh, yeah that we make. Amazing. So it's going to be an aggressive plan and goal for you to achieve the 20,000 by 2040. <laughs> it's all, it all fits together, yeah. And I would say in the beginning, like when, when we first met people, they looked at me also and they said like i mean you are crazy like have that's what <laughs> everyone always says in business what's your core focus you know focus on one thing and i very much push back and now it's been incredible to show that actually you know not everything has an easy fix not every you know if i could develop an app that simply saves the ocean if everyone downloads it well that'd be great but it's not the reality so it's comp these are complex problems and sometimes yeah, and often you need a holistic approach to really tackle them at a at a more systemic level um yeah it doesn't make it any easier, doing, yeah. but uh, yeah <laughs> no i just wanted to say we're not doing things because it's easy because but because it's hard right so yeah yeah if it was easy anyone could have done it before so yeah exactly. although yeah yeah although i think the idea of sea rangers i mean why has no one else thought of that uh, you know <laughs> It, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's about time. Yeah. And sorry, I'm not sure if I could get it uh, correctly at the very beginning, but how did you start to assemble and like operate and uh, like maintain your ships? I'm I'm not sure I understood the very beginning of how you started it. Like, how did you how did you have fun to start to build a ship, and then later on more ships? Yeah. So um, so I of course initially connect, initially connected with shipbuilders. So I learned a lot about ship financing and then bit by bit, we got partners involved and on board. And it was, a, I actually lived in, in the UK and in the US before. So I came back to the Netherlands where I was born to start this project because a lot of the shipbuilding expertise is in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a yeah, big shipbuilding a country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. First uh, ship port, number one. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, in the exactly. So it's, so it's a question also around um, how do you make it exciting for that sector? that also has big challenges and, and big, um, you could say, ambitions around sustainability and things that want to move forward. So I think we were able to design the product in such a way that insurance companies, banks, uh, finance, you know, investors, all types of people that typically invest and support and make possible this shipbuilding work traditionally suddenly saw in us an alternative and were willing to invest in it. But that's still an uphill struggle one of the biggest things for me, and we only are just about to achieve that, is that we have structural financing, low costs, like low interest, traditional banking financing for our shipbuilding. Because actually crowdfunding is very expensive. I don't want any philanthropic funds or donations or subsidies in the shipbuilding. I wanna prove that it works as a business model. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's of course for us where we raise the bar for ourselves, really proving that this model works as a business. Um, and that's, of course, the coming years we'll have to see as we scale it internationally. There's a real feeling or of you know, either this will totally fall apart. It was a great idea, but it doesn't work. But more likely, it, you know, it will really take off and be successful because, of course, this impact we need to see globally. And, it, and there is a high demand for this kind of impact globally. Mm. Okay. Thank you. So we started up with crowdfunding? Yeah, so we looked at the crowdfunding, but crowdfunding is actually, at the end of the day, very expensive. 
okay. it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's not always the best option. I love the idea of crowdfunding, but um, yeah, it's uh, at least for the shipbuilding, it was not. not it's not for the industry, right? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's ask if anyone has uh, other questions from the audience. Thank you, Annette. And <laughs> in the meantime, let me ask you, Vita. Um, so. You founded the Sea Ranger service in, uh, in uh, 2016, and so far many years um, passed. What's, what's your take or what would you advise young social entrepreneurs who would like to start their journey or who started, but they are at the very beginning? What to yeah. invest in, where to focus? Um... I think it really helps to have focus and I say this, even though, of course, I do something quite broad, but it's still the underlying thought for me is something laser focused. The idea of how do we manage the ocean, you know, and typically it's only some environmental scientists or the Coast Guard that, you know, thinks about that. So I think it really helps to, to, spend, to find something that you're passionate about that makes you tick and really get stuck. Not, you know, and, and actually you know, try and visualize what an ideal scenario for you would look like. And for me, this, I think it's really fascinating, right? So let's say I, early on years ago, I would, I would sort of dream in my head, I'm like, okay, I have this idea of this sea ranger, you know, with a uniform, like sort of very prominent. And then, yeah, we have all these ships all around the world and we're working with national governments. And, and of course, no one took me seriously in the beginning. Everyone would, you know, the, my youthful enthusiasm and the ambition of the project would be perceived as naivety. So I get a lot of little pats on the back, like, sure you are, like, ah, sure, we're going to do that. And so I think it's also a question of once you know what, what makes you tick, once you know what your passion is, you know, really get stuck in. And, and if it takes two years or 10 years or 20 years, it doesn't matter. At some point, people will recognize you for, you know, that part, uh, for that issue, for that way of working. Um, and over time, um, yeah, you will get recognized for it and supported for it. And I think that's the most important lesson I've learned is you got to really bite hard and not let go. Hmm. Has it ever happened to you that you wanted to just give up after all these uh, critics that you received? Well, uh, maybe it's actually, uh, maybe it's a stereotype I had that was initially reinforced. And that stereotype is that in the maritime industry, it's very much old white men that dominate things. It's a very traditional industry. So we would meet the big maritime CEOs of some of the world's largest companies. We'd meet them and talk to them about, you know, the Sea Ranger service. And in the first few years, they, I mean, I've been to presentations where literally at the end of my presentation, there would be a silence and people would laugh and that would be the end of it, right? So, and bit by bit, because, it, I don't know, maybe in the maritime industry as well, people are a bit more tough, you know, they're, it's very no nonsense. And over time, I found that that strengthened me. Whenever I got a no, I was like, okay, I'll, you know, maybe there's a healthy dose of ego in there as well on my part thinking, <laughs> I will prove to you that it can work. And, and ultimately that really, I think, helped to boost my effort. So, and we were talking to a lot of people. And so it's also, I think, once you have your issue and once you, you know, really know what you're passionate about and want to work on, it's about meeting everybody in, in that sector. It's about, you know, making sure you get on stage, make sure you talk to people. It doesn't matter. The first times I presented was terrible. You know, I, was, I, I didn't even dare to speak in public. Um, and I was very nervous and had anxiety. And, and I just think by doing this repeatedly and again and again, believing in yourself, not giving up, it's just over time as you get there. Mm. Uh, it's very much like we have the saying in Hungarian that if, if they close the door in front of you, then get inside through the window. So. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, but during our first uh, online event, we talked with uh, Matthias, who's uh, running this um, program for young change makers. And we asked like what, how he sees it, what are the biggest uh, challenges for young social entrepreneurs? And I'm wondering what you see as, as the biggest challenge that would it one young social entrepreneur can face. Yeah. So I think it's, one would be skepticism. Mm -hmm. on for, uh, and that actually then translate into a lack of access or an opportunity. 
And so I think there's a real issue with gaining access to the levels where you get the kind of support and guidance and financing, uh, you know, where you can really excel. So I'm, you know, I, I can talk quite well. And, you know, if, if I put my hair like this and I shave properly <laughs> and I put on a suit, I'm, no, but it, it works, you know, I, I'm very It's a very important skill, yes. Yeah, but I'm, I'm very privileged. You know, I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm a white middle-class guy, you know, in, in Europe. If I dress well, I can sort of play the part. And I, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's a real issue. How do you get your foot in the door? How do you, you know, when I talk about us working with IKEA or PwC or with governments, where do you even start? You know, in, in the UK, our talks are directly at Downing Street level. We talk to Downing Street about our work. And that's just because I know someone that knows someone else and I talk to them and I find a way in. And, then all, and so it's also about claiming that space. Nobody, nobody is going to suddenly meet you and say, oh, you know, I'll take you by the hand and I'm going to show you. And I'm, it, is, it is unforgiving. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of hard work. Um, and, and that's just the way it is. So it's, it's, if, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to have that focus, not give up and believe in yourself and just, then, then you ultimately get there because you claim that space for yourself. And I think that's also really important. I would never say, you know, and I think there's this whole mantra in more traditional business, like startup communities, like, you know, don't give a fuck, like just go. And I don't, I don't buy into that. I think it is about compassion and showing you know, good leadership and building a community and being inclusive and um, acknowledging your privileges. And, you know, and in our case as well, we, we have, we are increasingly focused on ethnic diversity in, in the Sea Rangers. We recruit, um, we have a lot of women that join uh, the Sea Ranger yeah. service. Uh, that's actually our problem. We have far too many, you know, the, our, our diversity is a little bit out of balance in that way, but it's all, all really good. It's all really good. So, um, yeah, but you have to really claim that space. Um, and I, no one ever asked us when we, uh, at some point, the Dutch government said, you know, um, just to clarify, nobody asked you to do this, right? And we were like, no, we, we came up with this idea ourselves. And then, and so, so it's also, you don't, don't wait for permission, you know, mm -hmm. you, yeah, make your plan, uh, go for it and, 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 and continually improve and listen to people, uh, take in critical feedback, but yeah, keep, keep that focus. And that's, very tiring so it's also about how do you manage your personal energy how do you avoid burnout how do you take care of your own mental well-being especially with all the working at home and, and such um, but yeah there's there's a lot a lot involved yeah we just talked about it before it even started that we need to sometimes give um uh give some break to ourselves and give permission to have a break yeah but I wanted to ask, uh, because you mentioned burnout and, and also Matthias mentioned that burnout is a huge risk that affects uh, young uh, social uh, entrepreneurs. Have you ever experienced it? Have you went through it? Or what do you do actually to, uh, to, um, to not get into that um, yeah. dark circle? I, once, many, many years ago, I had a period where I think later was burnout. I worked mm -hmm. on a really big project and the moment that was finished, there was sort of nothing. There was sort of nothing left. So it's, yeah. Um, I think it's, I would say there's sort of a couple of things there. One is I'm of course in a position where I can set the pace. So I work hard and, and, and I'm, you know, I think very efficient and, you know, so all my colleagues sort of have to follow me in that direction. But um, I think that there's no sort of expectation I feel uh, of course, there's expectation from our investors and the government partners and everything else, but I, I sort of, I'm able to, yeah, keep that at bay. Um, I think if you work in a company and there's a lot of pressure on you and you feel you don't have a lot of freedom to, you know, design your own way you work, and that, of course, can be dreadful. I think it's so important that, you know, the roles and responsibilities in an organization are clear, but that people will have the freedom to organize their own work, you know. Um, secondly, perhaps it's also a question on, uh, having something that isn't work, being passionate and having something that has nothing to do or that is really outside of the uh, scope of work. So so perhaps because the Sea Ranger service was sort of not enough for me uh, in terms of the ambition and where we're heading, um, I have sort of this vision that actually with our zero emission ships at sea, we can also have electric aircraft that patrol from the air. Um, so I recently, last year, decided to start my training as a conservation pilot. So 
I now, you know, twice a week, I'm, I, I do pilot training. I go in the air, I fly, I learn about this because I want to apply to the work. But it's also something for me personally that means I'm outside, I'm meeting other people, I'm doing something very different, very actively. Um, and that's, again, a big privilege. It's very hard. But, you know, that is something that, that I decided to do and, and is working for me. So so important to have something beyond the day-to-day. Did you actually go through the whole bootcamp training yourself when you started? No, it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I'm not even sure. <laughs> you're if doing I could it have. right now. <laughs> yeah. But then again, I also do never wear the Sea Ranger uniform. I'm not oh, a Sea okay. Ranger, right? So I don't, that's a privilege I have not attained yet. Mm. And I'm too and, old by now, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you never got any critique um, because you've never tried this? You've never no. been through the... No, no. And it's also, mm. I think it's also about recognizing that everyone has a role to play, you know, of course. And my role is ensuring we can finance and we have the contracts and, you know, and, and the Sea Rangers have a different role where they're physically on the ship. And part of the training and the discipline is also to do in the boot camp with the fact that if you work on a sailing ship that is actively sailing, like as a work ship, it's very physical. So there are physical requirements simply for us to work safely because you're like hoisting sails and it's, yeah. it's very physically demanding. Um, yeah, I, I'll join a boot camp one day, I think. But <laughs> I still have some exercising to do before. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's, it's actually a, a very, very valid point. And why I'm just asking is because it happened to me uh, with the previous idea that um, I was thinking about an application, uh, like, you know, working with uh, children. And then the critique that I got always is like, are you a mother? No, then how can you know that? And I'm like, sometimes it's wow. much better to 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 give permission to others to, to do the job for, for mothers, because being an external party, you see things differently. Of course, yeah, but also cool. like, who do you have to justify that to, right? If sure. that's a program you want to start, then then that's yeah. something, yeah, you should do. And there's always people who, you know, disagree or, th- th- yeah, that's just maybe part also of the fact that you are, you know, making waves, that people are coming back to you and that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask the audience, do you have any other questions before we close them? If not, then I have one more question because I think your um, your career and your life is very inspiring. And from being an activist, an environmental activist, becoming actually an entrepreneur who has a sustainable, a financially sustainable business, who's doing actually impact, positive impact. I think it's very it's it's a great example. And but I'm curious. Um, what can we do as individuals for um, for the environment in, in everyday life and what you do as Vita in your everyday life? Don't I do enough for it? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh my God, no, you are right. I mean, I think that there's of course so many, I mean, there's so many things you do. I mean, you know, I recycle, I, I, I'm vegan. I've been vegan for like over almost 20 years. Um, no, I cycle everywhere. I don't own a car. I mean, but that's those are things that I can do in my own sort of environment, right? So I think the notions on, you know, take care of what you eat, uh, make sure you don't waste too much. I mean, you know, that you have a low footprint in life. I'd like to think that everybody who you know is interested in these issues already thinks about that. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that we, of course, have made the decision, me and my team, to do something really big. And ambitious but that is of course only one piece of the puzzle because the puzzle also includes all the small smaller local initiatives regional initiatives and all of that matters so of course nature literally is us the environment is everything around us and whether that's within your own streets or when you're within your town or city or or, or further afield um you know i just saw a problem and i i thought i sort of you know i thought of a solution that i thought could work and it's working out well now, but yeah, impact has to be made at all levels. So I think whatever people can do, um, you know, I think that's already a win for the planet. Okay. Thank you so much, Vita, for joining us today Thank and you. for this great and exciting conversation. I think we all learned a lot. Um, so if there are no questions, 
know. Then uh, I would like to thank you all for joining.